Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm Grace. And the three of us together are going to do something rather special for Vlog 72. We're going to be looking at communication strategies between postgraduate students and their supervisors. Now this vlog comes via request. A lot of our soirees have requested you guys really need to be talking about how we communicate with our supervisors and how supervisors communicate with us. And a lot of the big surveys that we've undertaken with you guys as you finish and on the way through in your candidature really focus on, right, well, I didn't really get my meaning across to my supervisor. So I thought we'd involve the wonderful Grace and the wonderful Sophie in an important conversation. So yes, this is a vlog for you, but because we are ladies of leisure, we are also <laughs> multitasking this video and we're using it as a flipped seminar to train supervisors in communication skills as well. So we're so lucky to have Grace and Sophie with us. And let me just explain, we'll hear more about them through the seminar today. They're here for many reasons. Firstly, they're fabulous. Uh, secondly, they represent two very different parts of the university, but also and importantly, they are your postgraduate reps at the highest governance levels at this university, and they represent you incredibly well. So we made a decision, the three of us, that we would run this session together, and I think it's important. And let me just say, as someone who has worked all around the world and worked with a lot of postgraduate reps, I've never seen two reps as good as these two. Oh, they represent you well. <laughs> they do. They, they, you, you are caring, you are compassionate, and you engage with policy and procedure on the ground and at the top end so brilliantly. So we're lucky to have you both. So hello. hello. <laughs> um, and, and should we start by doing the, the question that students either love or hate? <laughs> so if you might want to start us off, yeah. tell us about your PhD. Yay, I love that question. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, so I'm doing a PhD in clinical psychology and my research is on food cravings. So. My research is looking at ways that we can reduce uh, food cravings and then reduce people's unwanted consumption of those craved foods. So I'm particularly interested in mindfulness and using that as a technique to um, kind of think differently about our thoughts and so far we've found that that's actually been helpful. And that's amazing. I mean, mindfulness is big in so many areas, but it's interesting how it works in food mm. and body regulation particularly. Oh, mm -hmm. that's amazing. What a great thesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, batter up, Grace. <laughs> um, so I am doing my PhD in creative writing, which means that I have to do a novel length uh, creative work and then a critical exegesis to contextualise that. And I'm looking at the American author David Foster Wallace, Oh, and wow. not many people know who he is when wow. I say it sometimes. <laughs> wow. And uh, the idea, well, the suggestion in his works that American citizens are in a state of protracted adolescence. So mm -hmm. that's kind of looking at the politics and citizenship and things like that. And can I say very timely with yes. the Donald Trump mm -hmm. administration, yes. where Donald Trump's relationship with Twitter may be many things, but probably infantile, mm -hmm. maybe one word we can use to describe that. So fantastic. Are you doing so artifact exegesis? So yes. brilliant. So very unusual, very specialist mode of presentation, mm -hmm. as is so. So let's get into this. And can I just start with you both about what you believe are the characteristics of an effective supervisor. I've never asked you both that question, mm -hmm. but for you and Grace, we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. When I'm saying to you, what's a good supervisor, what's an effective supervisor, mm -hmm. what hits your brain? Um, first and foremost, someone who's engaged in that role um, and that values that role, I think. they want You want a supervisor to want to be a supervisor, not just doing it as part of the rest of their duties and everything. Um, mm -hmm. Someone who can communicate well and who respects the student I think is important. As well as wanting to um, engage in further professional development, I think as well. Wow, so you've really talked about the professional role and also a duty of care I think came yeah. across there as well. Yes, it's about workload and it's a job, but it's more than a job. Mm -hmm. What do you think, so? Um The two things that spring to my mind are probably open communication, someone being approachable to a student and open to their ideas but also a good balance of giving guidance when it's needed as well. Obviously the PhD is a much more independent project for the student than they might be used to but um, the, the supervisor can provide a lot of really helpful guidance where it's needed as well. And um, I think also in, uh, 
helping the student prepare for employment and you know setting up networking opportunities or you know giving guidance in that area as well beyond the actual thesis itself. Again, different answers, but I love the guide on the side model, which mm -hmm. is what you've applied there, but also that it doesn't stop when the PhD is submitted. Yeah. So we call that you know, post-candidature care. Mm -hmm. So fantastic answers. Now I'm going to get quite crunchy with this now, and this is mm -hmm. quite hard, and I don't know your personal experience on this, so let's find out. I think there are some challenges that emerge between students and supervisors if the student and the supervisor know each other very well. Mm -hmm. So maybe they went through the undergraduate years together, they were the honours supervisor, perhaps master's supervisor, and it's just sort of this groove thing and just suddenly you're the PhD supervisor. And I think that might be a challenge. I think we see issues presenting downstairs in the office, but in the literature, that things are taken for granted whereas the PhD is actually a very distinctive moment. What, what would you advise? Have you, do, have you worked with people all the way through? You've done that. Mm -hmm. So do you think there are particular challenges in creating that break, that you know, a PhD is different, or mm -hmm. are there huge advantages? What do you think about that? Um, I guess when I was starting my PhD, I felt like it was an advantage because I knew what the working relationship would be like, and I knew that I could work well with this supervisor um, and the co-supervisor. But definitely, I think the expectations are different and just the whole process I found um, that I was more independent as a PhD student and at the start that was a bit of a struggle. But I think just talking about that and it's good to discuss your, your expectations of how the next you know, three years are going to go, what are your plans. Um, just, just being open with the discussions has been really helpful. So open and avert, so don't yes. have the assumptions. Be clear that you are stating, look, we've, we know each other well, but this is something different, and let's explore those differences. Yeah, and, and having the frequent reviews as well is useful for, do you think that you're meeting frequently enough? Like, how are you finding how it's going so far? Because that um, almost forces the conversation sometimes if it's not happening. Yeah, that, wow. that's helpful as well. Brilliant. So. It, those assumptions can be very damaging to a PhD. Yeah. Now, Grace, did you go all the way through with yeah. someone? Or, or you did as well. Wow. Yeah. So my honours supervisor is also my PhD supervisor, and um, and I was my associate supervisor. And so, kind of like you, that was good. I felt like our relationship was good and continuing mm -hmm. made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good reason to stick with the same supervisor. But pretty much the same answer. I think it's about having that conversation at the start, um, particularly about how different a PhD is to an honours mm. thesis and setting up those new expectations right from word go. And I wonder, besides new expectations, is it also a new relationship in different ways? Like it's the same mm. people, yeah, but does the relationship change? I feel like I'm a colleague of mm. my supervisors now rather than this, I mean, there is still that hierarchy, but I feel less, like when I was in honours, I felt more like an undergrad student, which I was. Um, than I do now. It's a mm. different working relationship. Re really well mm. said. I, I'm going to push you both now outside of your personal comfort zone because the next question is what you haven't experienced, mm. but just about every international student does, and a lot of students move between universities now from undergraduate to master's or PhD. So what would you both recommend in building a relationship from nothing? So you basically, you've never really known this person before and suddenly they are your PhD supervisor. What sort of groundwork would you recommend the student and the supervisor does in that environment? I think getting to know the supervisor and the supervisor getting to know the student perhaps in a more informal way before you get right down to the work side of it. So just getting to know whether you can communicate well just before even getting into it, I suppose. And it, I can imagine it would be quite intimidating for a student to meet someone new that you might have read about their track record and, and what they're about. but. Um, meeting someone in the flesh is you know, a different matter and if you're coming from another country you might not get to meet them before you kind of make that um, agreement that you're going to work with that person so yeah I imagine that would come with a lot of challenges. And you've used the word intimidation there too, is there something that the supervisors could do to manage that intimidation so, so that it doesn't exist because that's a frightening yeah. word for me, yeah. is there something a supervisor could do? I think just acknowledging that it could be intimidating it, and acknowledging that maybe the student might be more aware of that power imbalance than they are. So just, um, yeah, getting to know them both from both sides, getting to know the other as a person perhaps before kind of getting into... I think that's terrific because it, it, is, it is a personal relationship. Yeah. 
That's fantastic. Yeah. Where are you on this? Um, pr- pretty much the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> two <I think> brilliant <laughs> women. <laughs> <laughs> they're two kind of overused words, but I think communication and respect is the main thing. Mm-hmm. And just kind of recognising that whether you're the student or the supervisor, that you're dealing with another human being who's as complex and valuable and well, human as you are, you mm-hmm. know, and just kind of treat that person the way you want to be treated. I think that's all you can really start with. But, but I love how you, you've actually said spend the time to get the human relationship right mm. before we even think about student and supervisor as roles because yeah. mm. human beings are going to spend three years together mm. yeah. and, a long time. and kindness and decency and respect from both sides is mm. crucial. Mm. It is cl- a fantastic answer, brilliant, mm. the pair of you. The next question, I suppose, we start to get into the scary bit of, of the vlog where what happens when things go wrong. Mm. So about 40% of PhD and research master's students change one or more of their supervisors during their candidature. Shock horror. A second stat is also interesting here, a characteristic of students who don't finish is that they change supervisors. Right. Mm. So what do you believe are the right reasons to change supervisors? And, and, and yes, whatever higher power is with us is really agitated by this question, can I say. Um, wonderful, Grace, what's your feeling? You know, what would have to happen that, that it's a good idea to change supervisors? And by the way, I do. I think if it's a bad situation, you should change. But what would that bad situation be? Well, I think each case is individual in its own way, but I think that um, basically a broad umbrella reason is if the supervisor isn't supporting you in a way that you can reasonably expect of them, um, I think that there's probably a bare minimum in that relationship from each person. And if that's not being met, I think that's a sign that you need to review that relationship. But it gets really tricky when you try and break down what that means in terms of like how available a supervisor should be to you and all of that. Mm. So, so you think there are deal breakers, and maybe those deal breakers involve you know regularity of meetings, feedback on work. Yeah, yeah, just um, yeah, and I mean obviously, and then you can go into even darker territory of bullying and things, and you just don't. Yeah, I think that there is a bare minimum. There, there are some reasonable expectations to have of a supervisory relationship and if they're not being met then that's probably a time to have a conversation. Re- really well said and you know, cultural safety is everything mm-hmm. that we do at Flinders and the three of us spend a lot of time making sure students are feeling culturally safe and that's for me always a deal breaker. So if a student comes in, they're not culturally safe, they don't leave that office until they are culturally safe. So I think mm-hmm. that was a really, really strong point to make. Mm-hmm. I guess I, I totally agree with what and how you, how you kind of framed it. I think that if you're in that point where you feel totally unsupported or um, yeah, or bullied or something like that, just um, don't suffer alone. and Don't think that you have to suffer through it alone. It can feel like you and the supervisor are it, but um, there are other people who you can talk to who are a bit more objective and it just helps to talk about it with others and they have other perspectives and can help you figure out what to do next. I mean, excellent, because you're never on your own. You've got these two wonderful women. So if something odd occurs, just call one of these Mm. two wonderful women and they're there to sit with you, have a cup of coffee. And if you feel able to explain what's going on to third parties, then they can be with you to do that. And it could be health and counselling. It could also be the Office of Graduate Research. And as I said, cultural safety is absolutely what we do. Mm. So so I think just get out of it, but also share the story. I think that's brilliant. If you can. If you, if you can. Now we've gone to the negative questions, we went to the dark side, (laughs) and we're just going to come back at this point about positive solutions. So in a scenario, say something bad happens in a meeting, so something like goes wrong, whatever that wrongness may be, so perhaps the supervisor was tired and something sharp comes out or something nasty comes out, or the student has disappointed the supervisor in some way, how would you handle that in real time, or would you handle it in real time? So you're in a meeting, something goes wrong. What do you do, Soph? I find it helpful to talk to other students, if I can, and um, or, or talk about it. I think in terms of repairing some, a kind of blip that's happened within the supervisory relationship, I'd take a bit of time and then, uh, depending on what's happened, think about how I want to talk about it with my supervisor and then approach it after a bit of space and talk about what exactly happened and how we can kind of move 
So that's excellent. You wouldn't do anything in the moment. You'd leave the meeting, so. talk to your mates, talk to your colleagues, take a breath, and then work out how to proceed. And some of that could be, you know, writing it in an email that look, look, this occurred. Get it all cool and calm, and in the next meeting, let's talk this through. Yeah. But so you would actually leave the situation, think, and proceed. Yeah. I think so, especially if we're both in kind of a heightened emotional state. Because I think another thing to remember is. Particularly for me, I'm not sure if it's everyone's experience, but it's the thesis and this whole doctoral journey that we're on is quite closely tied to my identity. So sometimes criticism can feel like a personal affront or, yeah. or even perceived criticism if it's not yeah. a criticism. Um, so I think that's why we can get emotional when I, things happen. You are a very wise woman and you've heard me say thousands of times, you are not your thesis. Yeah. There's no. the work out there and the critiquers of the work, not you, but that in a PhD, it, it's paper thin yeah. in the space, isn't it? Yeah. I think now, oh. a, a bit, bit of a way along in my, in my um, degree, um, yeah, getting this space. But the, <laughs> the grazes are quite easy early on. Yes. So well said. Mm -hmm. Madame? Again, pretty much the same. I mean, I think we'd all like to be able to deal with something in the situation if we felt we could be assertive enough to kind of go, oh, look, you know, what you just said, this is how it made me feel. But mm -hmm. when you're both kind of, you know, possibly reacting, not responding, you do need that space. And I, I'm someone who doesn't love confrontation, mm -hmm. so I would probably <laughs> take that time to go away as well and kind of really think, is this something that I want to pursue, is it worth it, and um, and then take it from there. Yeah, I think that's great. I, and again, I hadn't thought that. I was thinking, oh, look, in the moment, how do you handle it? But actually, let it cool, leave, and return to it. I think they're, mm -hmm. they're great strategies. I think to do something in the moment relies on you both being quite reasonable, calm mm -hmm. people, and sometimes if the circumstances aren't right, you can't manage that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it would be great to be able to do it in that moment, but... Um, if the stars aren't aligning, you probably just need to back off for a bit. Mm -hmm. And you've picked up the volatility that sometimes exists mm -hmm. in the supervisor-student relationship. Both are working very hard, both are often mm -hmm. tired. It can be quite a tight, tense experience. And that leads to the, the next question. When students, and they so often say this to me, feel intimidated by their supervisor. So this is the bit really, I suppose, for a lot of the supervisors out there. How do we manage that? How do we stop students being frightened of us? Because mm. so often I hear, oh, look, my supervisor's a guru, my supervisor's a god, you know, I'm just, you know, I look up to this person so much. And, and I'm not sure how positive or productive that type of relationship is. So mm. what could supervisors do to manage that? Do you want to start us off, sorry? I think in, in my experience, people, I've heard people say the same thing, but it's more likely to be said when someone doesn't hasn't had much contact with that person either, particularly the word intimidating, I'd say. So um, people that I know who, who might have thought, oh, I'm going to be working with this person, I'm a bit scared or a bit nervous, I think it's a balance of respect for that person, but also maybe feeling a little bit like, what if I say the wrong thing or what if it doesn't go well, but getting to know them, they get to know them as another person and they're just another human being just like me. And, I guess just being aware of that, both being aware of that power imbalance and that the student might feel it more than they do. Wow, well, and also just, and also being really cool with failure, because the yeah. nature of research is a lot goes wrong a lot of the yeah. time. We go, you know what, you're gonna have a go, you're gonna stuff up, it's yeah. cool, we all make errors, mm -hmm. and, and nothing you do is a deal breaker. Yeah. Maybe that's the way forward. Yeah. Re really well said, madam. Yeah, I think if your supervisor can be down to earth and just, admit that they're fallible as well mm -hmm. you know I think it is I think it is about getting to know them too mm -hmm. and kind of establishing that relationship um, yeah I think you know for example like tutoring at university I think a good way of connecting with students is to know my own limitations um, because I think you know if you're a student and you've got your supervisor they've been and done what you are just trying to do and that's where some of the intimidation comes from got it know? yeah yeah but, but also I'd say if it helps you, and the three of us have talked about this a lot, higher education, higher degrees right now is completely different to five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And so what you guys are going through right now is incredibly challenging and is incredibly difficult in terms of employability and all the stuff that's going on around you. So n never be intimidated because in some ways you're doing it tougher than your supervisor did. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. 
<laughs> just because I mean, people, oh, well, when I did my PhD, yeah, when you did your PhD, like about ten percent of the population went to university. Mm. You know, you were lucky. You were lucky. You were fortunate. Different party now, much more competitive. And I think maybe just one way of looking at it for both of you is to realise that you're both now two independent researchers. Like your supervisor still does kind of what you're doing, just you know, not a PhD, but at a higher level, and yeah. like it's it's mm. all research, so. There's, there's common ground there. And, yeah. it, and of course, a lot of guys and gals write together with their supervisor, you know, in the mm -hmm. lab-based environments, big writing teams working together. And so that should, you know, at its best, create that collaborative environment that, that we hope is not intimidatory. Yeah. So beautifully said, beautifully said. This one's actually for me. I'm asking this question for myself. I'm always very conscious, and you know Thursday mornings I do all my supervisions, so I do supervisions from 8.30 till 10.30 in a row. And I get quite tired by the time I'm in sort of meeting three or four. And I always worry that every sentence I say, if I get it wrong, it could hurt the student. So if I just phrase things wrongly or I'm a bit sharp, that the student might really take that to heart mm -hmm. and, and it would hurt them. What would, what would you advise for students in terms of managing, you know, maybe a tired supervisor and managing those sort of unfortunate sentences. What would you say to the supervisors and the students? Do we have to be really careful in those engagements? I think just admit that you're tired. <laughs> yeah. Tell the student where you're coming from and say, look, I, if anything comes out wrong, I, please don't take it to heart. I'm just having like a shit day. Yeah. 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 Mm. I guess um, remembering that it's about the work and it's not about you. Um, and it's about improving your your mutual goal of improving the work, I suppose. It, sometimes yeah. something might sting, but reminding yourself that, um, yeah, that it's about improving the work. It's not about you as a person or, yeah. or about how much effort you've put into the work. It's, yeah, it's a hard one, though. It is, but have you both found that, that you know, because, I mean, you've got fantastic supervisors, mm, yeah. the pair of you, but there must be points where something... We've made a mistake. We've got. We've said just a little bit too much, or it's just been a little bit too close to the bone. And you mm -hmm. sort of go, and sometimes you know the moment it's come out of your mouth, you wish you could eat the words mm -hmm. back. So do you think maybe supervisors going, well, sorry, that came out wrong, eh? Yeah, and that really yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And that'll that'll handle it a bit better. So let's talk about the other flashpoint in communication strategies between supervisors and students, and that's email. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the good ways to use email between staff and students and some of the problematic ones? Grace, do you want to start off? Yeah, yeah sure. I think uh, it's just a matter of both of you being mindful um, and respecting each other's time. Like, I think it's, don't expect an immediate response, but expect a timely one. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that mean for you? What is timely? Again, it probably depends on the individual. I. Yeah, it depends on the expectations you've set up between the two yeah. of you. Well I tend to kind of know a certain time period can pass and then I'll follow something up if I feel I need to. Um, but I think, you know, as a student, just recognise that your supervisor is quite busy and as a supervisor, recognise that sometimes your student is waiting on you before they can progress somewhere. Yeah. So yeah. just having that mutual respect is important, I think. Mm. And feedback and getting the drafts back in a timely fashion. Yeah. Because I'm aware you guys, I, I, I'm so old I forget this, but of course you're sitting waiting for a draft mm -hmm. and there's not much you can do until you get that draft. So you're sitting mm -hmm. there waiting. Yeah. And that's a reminder, I think, for supervisors. Mm -hmm. I think um, I totally agree that it, it's based on the expectations that both, both of you have. Personally, I use emails with my supervisor to set up in-person meetings because I think that's both of our preference for discussing nice. work and um, asking questions about a certain project. Um, so I try not to bombard my supervisor with emails as well because, yeah, the same, the same thing. They've got so many other things on their plate. But um, I've had great prompt emails back from my supervisor and I've, throughout the time I, I can rely on that. That's fantastic. So and that's been super helpful. And you, you think very much the short and sharp email is the way to go. I always yeah. laugh. You know the people that write war and peace emails? Yeah. <laughs> now, let me share five and a half pages with you now. You know, <laughs> sent, you know sent it to 10 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. You know those people? Um, so that's probably not a good use of email. And yeah. also mm -hmm. maybe thinking about the time you send emails to. Mm -hmm. I certainly try and model with our students. I, I mean, I get up very early and I try never to send emails at those times because I think that, that does bad practice for you guys. Use normal 
work, working hours yeah. and yeah. that models good behaviour for the students. That they shouldn't be on email at two o'clock in the morning or at eleven o'clock at night. Yeah. Yeah. And anything more than about three paragraphs. Yeah. You're more likely to get a response if it's a short email. Mm. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, maybe a tweet. Maybe yeah. 140 <laughs> characters. But it'll be fine. We've done email. Now the final question. Well, oh, this is a big one for me. So it's about social mm. media. Now, now I am friends with all of my PhD students, my former PhD students, a lot of you guys. I'm friends on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, academia.edu. I have no issues with this at all, right? Mm. Whenever I train supervisors at Flinders, though, and we run a scenario about would you be a friend on Facebook with your student, they all go, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, no, no. Maybe after they've graduated, five or ten years after they graduate, <laughs> I might, but no. So, so, so I sort of go, oh, right, I'll just shut up then. Um, where are you on this, so? Um, personally, I am linked in with my supervisor on the professional sort of yeah. social media platforms, but not the not Facebook. But um, I don't actually know. They have Facebook, so and I think our, our relationship's always been sort of strictly professional, and that's worked for us. So. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know if I'd have a real problem with it. So if you yeah. ha if you had students, and you will have students mm. shortly, so yeah. in three years' time you'll have a PhD student. Yeah. H how would you feel about being on LinkedIn, Academia.edu, Twitter, Facebook? I think I'd be okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mrs. Uh, kind of the opposite. I mean, I am friends with my supervisors on Facebook, on Instagram, on academia.edu and um, we have quite a, we have a professional relationship and we also, we're friends outside of that so, um, and that works really well for us and I'm sure it depends on the relationship of the individual student and supervisor. I think the only time that I would be concerned about doing that is if either person can't, um, can't keep in mind that say the student or the supervisor, they have a life outside of their work. So, you know, I think it becomes unhealthy if you start feeling like you need to censor how you're spending your time on social media, mm -hmm. like if you're at a party rather than responding to an email or something. I think if you can't keep those lines clear, then that would become a problem. Um, but if you can accept that each person has their own life to get on with, then I say go for it. And it's interesting you say that. I think that's why uh, Professor Zinu was a great, great uh, scholar that I followed through my life. He always said when you were teaching first year students or PhD students, students have the right to know the whole person. That, that we're not just just a scholar, just as, we're actually, we have a life and a family and relationships and we teach you better if you know who we are. Mm -hmm. And of course, we teach you better when we know who you are, who we, who we are. So it's a relationship. And maybe social media is part of that. Yeah, and I think that would break down that um, intimidation mm. a little bit as well because, you know. Well, yeah, my, my friends on Facebook include my 89-year-old father, Kevin. Aww. And um, so my students know Kevin, and if you know Kevin, <laughs> really, there's, there's no secrets left. Really. <laughs> so <cool. laughs> but fantastic and great answer. So, and I'll ask a question to you. When you're supervising in a couple of years, mm -hmm. would you have any issues with Facebook or Twitter? In principle, no. I think there's a knee-jerk reaction to feel a bit like, oh, you know, suddenly you're exposing yourself in a way that reveals that you're human, <laughs> um, which can be a little unsettling, but on principle, I think that's a good thing to do. So I think I would just have to get over that. And yeah, and, and also the issue you've always got to ask is if you're posting something on Facebook that you're worried that your mother, yeah. your boss mm -hmm. or then your student will see, <laughs> then, then maybe don't, yeah. you know. Just be smart about it. Fantastic. You can see why I invited them both. <laughs> to, to Sophie and to Grace, I love working with you both and I really feel it's a partnership between us to improve what we do at Flinders in the postgraduate space and I couldn't do what I do without you both and in every policy, every bit of work we do, you improve what we do every single day. So I hope the students who are watching this, they're inspirational, they're fantastic, mm -hmm. brilliant, interesting women. And I hope the supervisors that will be trained by us <laughs> uh, really learn from these two great women because th they've said a lot of stuff that's not even in the literature and certainly I didn't know what to think about. So thank you both. Thank you. You're thank wonderful you. to work with. Yeah. Uh, you're wonderful. <laughs> On behalf of us, we wish you love, light and peace. See you, team. <laughs> <laughs>